uh, we are also patients, remember, all of us, um, that there are uh, issues around access, but they aren't of the making of GP practices. They're not of our making. We don't have that sort of control, unfortunately. Uh, what we are trying to do is make the best of the situ situation we have. Uh, on telephone appointments, what's actually interesting is there was a, a study done very recently, I think it was from the King's Fund, that showed that, in fact, I think it showed that large proportion of the population, if not the majority, were quite happy with telephone consultations. I think the issue is... Um, online and on your smart speaker this is times radio it's 12 o'clock i'm matt Shirley, and this is times radio in a moment we'll go live to the house of commons for pmqs unpacked first the headlines this lunchtime a major report into failings at, of maternity services at the shrewsbury and telford nhs trust has found that 201 babies and nine mothers died the inquiry into the UK's biggest maternity scandal found better care might or would reasonably be expected to have made a difference. The independent report looked at more than 1,500 clinical incidents, most between 2000 and 2019. It concluded there was a reluctance to perform cesarean sections and repeated failure to learn lessons at the Trust. Jamie Wallace, the Conservative MP for Bridge End, has said in a post, I am trans, or to be more accurate, I want to be. The MP said, I felt, I felt this way since I was a very young child. MPs across the political divide have sent messages of support. The Prime Minister has said the Conservative Party will always give you and everyone else the love and support you need to be yourself. The Deputy Prime Minister, Dominic Raab, has told Times Radio Breakfast that the government is sceptical about claims from Moscow that is drastically cutting back operations near the capital, Kiev, in the northern city of uh, Kharkiv. Mr Raab said Russia needs to completely withdraw and not just make troop movements within Ukraine. It comes as explosions were heard this morning on the edge of the capital, Kyiv. Meanwhile, an advisor to Ukraine's president says Russia is withdrawing some troops around the capital. But his assessment is Moscow is deliberately keeping enough soldiers in place. The Ukrainian forces can't be moved to reinforce other areas. And the German Energy Ministry has urged every household and business in the country to use as little gas as possible ahead of a Kremlin deadline for EU firms to pay their bills in rubles by tomorrow. Russia has said it will stop supplies unless Gazprom and other state-owned energy companies receive payment in rubles. That brings you bang up to date with the very latest news. We'll bring you a full bulletin at 12.30. But now it's time for this. PMQ's Unpacked on Times Radio. Order, order. I call Matt Chorley and Tim Shipman. Yes, it's that time of the week. We'll go live to the House of Commons in just a moment. Tim Shipman, Chief Political Commentator for the Sunday Times, is here. How are you, Tim? Hello, Matt. I'm very well. What? Don't forget, you can watch along. Go online right now to YouTube, uh, search Times Radio. Uh, you can watch us uh, watch live uh, as we uh, unpack PMQs. Let us know where you are. People watching from New York, Bangkok, uh, and uh, Taunton. Lovely stuff. Uh, what do you expect? All the wild places. All the, all the wild places. <laughs> Uh, what do you expect uh, Keir Starmer to go on at PMQs this week? Well, it would be odd if he didn't have some sort of go at the fact that there are 20 members of the government have now been um, fined and sanctioned. Um, we don't really know who they all are, um, which gives him an opportunity to reopen um, uh, that issue should he wish to, and it would be curious if he didn't. Um, he might want to quote um, the Deputy Prime Minister, um, Dominic Raab, who came up with a rather wonderful line this morning that Boris Johnson told the truth to the best of his ability. 
when he was uh, addressing uh, the House of Commons uh, on these matters. Which wasn't very helpful. I mean, when he stood in at PMQs a couple of weeks ago, he just got the Prime Minister as a very social individual, which wasn't also uh, totally helpful. In a moment, we'll, uh, we'll bring you Keir Starmer uh, uh, asking questions at PMQs, but Boris Johnson kicking off with a statement. Let's take a listen. ...today for my honourable friend, the member for Bridge End. And I know uh, that the House stands uh, with you and will give you the support that you need to, leave, to live freely as yourself. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I'd like to thank Donna Ockenden and her whole team for the compassionate approach she's taken throughout this distressing review of maternity care at Shrewsbury and Telford Hospital's NHS Trust. Every woman giving birth has the right to a safe birth, and my heart, therefore, goes out to the families for the distress and uh, suffering that they've endured. My right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Health, will be making an oral statement this afternoon, setting out the Government's response. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Uh, well, let's just uh, jump in there. That's Boris Johnson paying tribute to Jamie Wallace, the Conservative MP for Bridge End, who uh, overnight posted on Twitter, I'm trans or more accurate, or to be more accurate, I want to be. It's interesting the Prime Minister using that the, the opportunity, the dispatch box to pay tribute to him, James. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it, it's, this is a tricky issue for both sides. Um, uh, the Conservatives want to appear individually compassionate without necessarily buying into uh, the whole sort of pro-trans agenda. And indeed, a party... Um, uh, last night with Tory MPs before this news came out, Boris Johnson was making jokes about trans rights and saying, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, or as Keir Starmer would have it, you know, people who were born female or born male. Um, Starmer himself had an awkward time in an interview um, last week in which he was repeatedly asked whether a woman can have a penis and was unable to provide an answer. So this is a tricky, tricky area for both parties. Um, but Boris Johnson wanting to be seen as a, a personally compassionate, um, and that's the approach that a lot of uh, Conservatives have tried to take to this. Uh, Boris Johnson also referring to the uh, Ockenden review, the terrible view into the, the failings of maternity care. Sajid Jared, the health secretary, making a statement uh, after PMQ, so I'll keep across that for you uh, this afternoon. Interestingly, Dominic Raab, the Justice Secretary, also expects to make a statement on public protection. Then Grant Shapps, the Transport Secretary, setting out measures responding to PNO, because obviously that's been a huge story as well. So it's a busy old afternoon in the House of Commons. We can go live to the House of Commons now, though. Watch along on YouTube. This is the last PMQs before the Easter recess. This is question number one from Keir Starmer. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I start by joining the Prime Minister in his remarks in relation to the Honourable Member for Bridge End? Yeah. Does the Prime Minister still think that he and the Chancellor are tax-cutting Conservatives? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, Mr Speaker, I certainly, I certainly do, because, I, I certainly do, because uh, this, is, uh, this is the government uh, that has just introduced not only uh, the biggest cut in, in fuel duty uh, ever, uh, but the, 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 biggest, uh, the biggest cut for, in tax for working people in the last... Ten years, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Seventy percent of the uh, of the of the, of the per population paying uh, national insurance contribution will have a substantial tax cut as a result of what uh, the Chancellor did. And if you take together, yeah, well, well, they don't like it, Mr. Speaker. It's true. They always put up taxes. That's why. We cut taxes. If you, they, that's, they love it. They love putting up taxes. Uh, <laughs> But if you take together they what we're it. doing with income tax and national insurance, it's the biggest tax cut proposed by my uh, right honourable friend, the Chancellor, for 25 years. Yeah. Oh, well, let's jump in there then. Um, well, here we go. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Back to last week. Keir Starmer going on um, the economy. Well, it's the safest probably area. Cost of I should living. Have said that at the start, should yeah. I? I mean, you know, cost of living is their best subject. Um, we've just had these big announcements, and and frankly, Rishi Sunak's uh, spring statement um, had the what's it torn out of it by um, the think tankers and and the economists. Um, yes, there were multiple tax cuts offered in it, but over, obviously, overall, the burden is rising, and. Um, this stuff's about to hit people in uh, their pockets next month. I do think, and actually, well, Rachel Reeves kept on about Alice in Wonderland in the Commons last week, but there is something about Alice in Wonderland and the world's been turned upside down that the Labour Party is attacking the Conservatives for putting up taxes. Uh, well, quite. I mean... Um, while, while the Tory Party are putting up taxes and pretending they aren't. Uh, yes. 
Um, but you know, that's the last five or six years of British politics, <laughs> isn't it? What's up is down, and um, yeah. Um, uh, somebody's, uh, Richard's just posted a question on on uh, YouTube saying, "Quick question, you may have answered before. Does the Prime Minister know the questions in advance?" No, but he can have a decent guess at the likely subject areas, and and frankly, sometimes he'll just have a bunch of lines prepared that um, <laughs> bear little Bayer resemblance <laughs> to the questions, and you know he pivots to them um, in good time. Uh, the only time you might know uh, is if a uh, Conservative MP wants some, him to say something helpful, so they might send some details of their. Well, youth yes, there's club. two ways that works, aren't there? One in which um, the local MP says, "If I ask this, can you say something helpful about this?" and I'll be on the front page of my local paper. And the other way it works is that the whips um, <laughs> dragoon whoever is on the list and say, "It'd be very helpful if you ask this," so the prime minister could uh, provide an answer that he wants to provide. Uh, there's probably rather more of that. Yes, there's a bit more of that going on. Right, let's go back then. He, he definitely put it this way: he definitely doesn't know what Keir Starmer's going to ask. We don't either. This is question number two. Uh, cut the nonsense. Yeah. And and, 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 and treat the British people with a bit of respect. Yeah. And let me take him through this slowly. Yeah. Fift, Fifteen tax rises, the highest tax burden for 70 years. Yeah. For every six pounds they're taking in tax rises, they're only handing one pound back. Yeah. Prime Minister, is that cutting taxes or is that raising taxes? Yeah. Prime Minister, uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I don't know where he's been for the last two years. Uh, but even, even by the, even by the standards, even by the standards of, even by the, yes, he has. Uh, even, even by the standards of Captain Hindsight, Mr. Speaker, uh, to, to obliterate, to obliterate the biggest pandemic. Uh, for the last century from his memory, to obliterate the 408 billion uh, that we've had to spend to look after people up and down the country is quite extraordinary. And this is a government that is getting on uh, with reducing the tax burden wherever we can. Uh, what we are doing, Mr Speaker, there's, there's, one, there's, one, uh, there's one measure I, I think he should be supporting, and that's the health and care levy, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, to fund our NHS. That's the one uh, they oppose, Mr Speaker. Every other, every other tax rise, they're all in favour of. <laughs> this, well, apart from the use of Captain Hindsight, we've not heard for some time, Tim. This is, Boris Johnson has mounted an argument there, which I, it feels to me like the government hasn't done enough. No, but the, actually it's sort of, it, it lingers in the thoughts of the public when you listen to focus groups, as yeah. I did last week. Um, you know, there is an understanding from most of the public that, COVID has cost a lot of money um, and the, the war in Ukraine is now costing a lot of money um, in terms of how it affects our uh, prices and the uh, uh, price of food, the price of energy. Um, and there is a sort of, you know, a lot of people will give the government a little bit of um, uh, respite um, from these arguments as a result of that. And it's certainly one that the Tories need to make. I think what's also there in the polling and a little bit in the focus groups is that there is a, people are beginning to split um, in terms of their vote, in terms of whether they buy that argument. I think, you know, I think even Labour supporters would have given the government a lot of credit during COVID, that it was a big problem and they were struggling to deal with it and anyone would have. I think increasingly what I see is people who are vaguely sympathetic to Boris Johnson will buy this argument and people who are not will begin to violently not buy this argument. Um, so in that sense, it's a little bit of normal politics returning. But um, I mean, the other thing you know, is a case really you can make. Rishi Sunak doing this is that the part of the reason they spent so much money was the furlough scheme, which actually has kept unemployment. You know, people have gone back into work. The big concern was that loads of people get thrown out of work, businesses go bust, and they end up stuck on jobless yeah, benefits and for I a think, long time. I think the biggest question for the next couple of years is whether this high inflation... Uh, becomes what it also became in you know the late seventies and early eighties, um, where it became an unemployment crisis um, as well, um, and a lot of people went out of work. And the Tories at the time were accused of effectively driving down inflation at the cost of jobs. Now, so far, inflation's still rising, um, and we're not yet in that situation. Um, but I think you know, as long as people are in work the pain of it will always be a lot less than it was in 1981. And if this government can get away with that, they've got a fighting chance of winning the next election. I yeah. think if you suddenly find 10% of the population out of work, I think it's quite hard to see how they do that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's go back to the House of Commons. And this is question number three from Keir Starmer. 
Mr Speaker, I can only hope that his police questionnaire was a bit more convincing than that. <laughs> This year, this year... Presumably he doesn't hope that. He'd uh, probably quite like it if Boris Johnson's response wasn't convincing. This year, British people convincing. face the worst fall in living standards on record. While they're counting every penny, the Prime Minister is hitting them with higher taxes. But in 2024, when there just so happens to be a general election, they will introduce a small tax cut. That's not taking difficult decisions. It's putting the Tory re-election campaign over and above helping people pay their bills. How did, how did he find a Chancellor as utterly cynical as he is? Prime Minister, what we have, Mr Speaker, is Old a question. Chancellor who took the tough decisions to look after uh, the UK economy uh, throughout the pandemic, who protected, who protected people up and down the land uh, with £408 billion worth of support, Mr. Speaker. And, and by the way, if we listen to them, if we listen to Captain, yeah, this is the truth, if we listen to Captain Hindsight, we would, not have come out of, we would not have come out of lockdown in July last year, Mr. Speaker. We would have stayed in lockdown over Christmas and New Year, Mr. Speaker with the result that the UK economy would not be growing in the way that it is, and so we would not be able to make the investments that we now are. And under Labour, we would have to tax more and borrow more, and they cannot be trusted, Mr Speaker, with the economy. Uh, well, let's uh, just jump in. Another, another out for Captain Hindsight. It's obviously back uh, as a thing. Uh, but we should point out, the Labour Party didn't actually call for a lockdown at Christmas, did they? No, they seemed... Um, they were a little concerned that the Prime Minister was uh, being too lax, if I remember rightly. Certainly they were asking questions that implied that that was their view. Um, as ever, Boris Johnson stretching things uh, to their limits, but, uh, you know, in, in a broad case, it's an argument he's been making. Um, and similarly broad case, um, you know, uh, Keir Starmer, they're going after Rishi Sunak. And, you know, we've talked about this before. The polling has suggested that the tarnish has come off, uh, the, 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 the lustre has come off the, the off the Chancellor, and they've been targeting him for quite some time. Um initially because he was popular and they wanted to try and undermine his popularity and now they see perhaps uh, a weakened minister that they can uh, properly go after. Interesting, though, that Boris Johnson defended him quite so vociferously. Yeah. But, you know, last week Johnson came out and said we need to do more and that was seen as undermining the Chancellor. Actually, privately, he was rather more supportive and certainly in Cabinet he was praising him um, to the high heavens in a little uh, a little bit like he did there, saying if he hadn't sort of got furlough and done all this stuff. And, that you know, it's now taken as a given, but that was a very complicated thing to do very quickly and, and, and Sunak did it um, uh, pretty well. Um, and Johnson seems still to be sort of at least standing in the same trench as him at the moment. And I suppose uh, it's interesting as well that, that Keir Starmer is going for very, very broad brush. I mean, we've got a hint there of the police... Please question as a sort of throwaway remark. Well, it's good that, in a sense, he's you know using humour to have a pop at it is probably when the, the information is, is limited. But then, but then if you, is your question, if your question is, how did you find a Chancellor as utterly cynical as he is? I mean, that's just not... I'm not sure what what he thinks that that's going to elicit. I suppose it's just a bit well, of it's knockabout. Just, it's a bit of knockabout. It's a line that, you know, that it, uh, may or may not get clipped. Um Let's see whether his peroration is uh, punchier <laughs> than that. Um, well, we're a little way off that uh, just yet. Uh, we've got another mm. three questions to go. You can, like I said, you can Don't watch. Sounds so excited, Matt. Go. There are. <laughs> Mike's texted in saying, "My heart sinks when Keir suggests he's going to go through something slowly." <laughs> uh, um, let us know what you think. You can go online to the uh, the YouTube channel. Uh, search on uh, YouTube for Times Radio. You can see Tim and I in all our glory, as well as Boris Johnson. And this question four from Keir Starmer. Keir Starmer, the tough decisions. Give me a break. Yeah. We know, we know, we know, Mr Speaker, we know who those two always ask to pay. Income stealth tax, a tax on working people. Tuition fee raid, a tax on working people. National insurance hike, a tax on working people. All while oil and gas companies see unexpected bumper profits. A windfall tax would raise billions and ease the burden on working people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr yeah. Speaker, the former CEO of BP, Lord John Brown, says a windfall tax is justifiable. Yeah, yeah. The current CEO says they have, in his words, more cash than they know what to do with. Yeah, yeah. 
Why is the Prime Minister more interested in shielding oil and gas profits than supporting working people? Mr Speaker, it's a classic example of what Labour has got wrong uh, in their, their, their period in office. Uh, the, the, the oil and gas companies are now investing £20 billion, uh, Mr Speaker, in ensuring that we have long-term energy supplies. And, and I remember the 1997 Labour manifesto actually said that there was no economic case for more nuclear power. We're, we're, we are now... We are, now having to, we are now having to make good the historic mistakes of the Labour Party by investing in our long-term energy supply. That is what we are doing. Everything that they are proposing would mean deterring investment, meaning higher prices for consumers and households up and down the land being worse off. But so was it last week or the week before when we were refighting... Uh, apparently, the reason we haven't got enough power now is because of the uh, new Labour manifesto in 1997, a mere 25 years ago. Yeah, though, interesting that answer. I, I mean, it's almost, bear with me here, Starmer is making sort of broad brush um, political debating points. And Boris Johnson, whisper it quietly, is actually providing slightly nuanced answers today. He's sort of saying... Actually, this energy stuff's a bit more complicated than that. You whack them with some money, but they're busy investing because we need to protect ourselves against dependence on, on the Russians. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, he's making a political point himself, of course, uh, with the nuclear power point and the, and the ancient manifesto. But um, this has been a problem that's got several decades of uh, fathers and mothers. Um, but um, you don't often hear the Tories actually bother to make the argument against windfall taxes. There is one that, you know, um, you're clobbering people at a time when you need them and that it deters businesses from sticking money in here because it creates uncertainty if, if industries think they can just be clobbered at the drop of a hat. Um, that's often an unpalatable political argument because a lot of people don't like these industries, and, and rightly so sometimes. Um, but, you know, he actually bothering to string string an argument together there. Um, and it's obviously... It's interesting when Boris Johnson gets on terrain that he sort of actually believes in um, and understands he can actually muster something proper that isn't just yarbu politics. It, it does seem... You're right. It's like PMQ has been turned on its head. It's very broad brush to the point of... I mean, being almost irrelevant, what Keir Starmer's uh, driving at. We'll wait for his peroration. We'll, we'll wait man. for his peroration. Yeah, we will. We will. Be amazing, but Boris Johnson, Boris Johnson, you know, really getting to the, the, the nitty gritty on fuel duty, on uh, what was spent during the pandemic and why that needs to be paid back. Um, and then, like you said, going into the, the history of energy policy. Last week, he seemed to have been reading up on all of the various employment legislation of the past 40 years. Is this a sign of a change? Is this part of the change in number 10 behind the scenes that he's... He's better briefed on the detail rather than just just doing the Captain Hindsight routine. It might routine. be. It might also be that he's got young kids and he's up in the middle of the night and he needs to find something <laughs> to put him back to sleep. So reading the 1994 Employment Relations but Act. But yes, it is, would imply yeah. that, you know, I mean, he presumably didn't read Labour's 1997 election manifesto himself. Somebody's gone and done that for him. And it suggests that um, Conservative campaign HQ is beginning to get its act together. They've put some new people in there. Uh, Oliver Dowden, the new chairman, is, is, is you know is building up that team, and it suggests that um, uh, their sort of attack machine is getting a bit of, a little bit more adept. Um, yeah, it seems a bit smart. And actually, I was just looking on the, the Labour manifesto. He's not even taken it out of context. It literally says, "We see no economic case for the building of any new nuclear power stations." Uh, but there we are. Right, uh, what we got? Number five. Yeah, we're not at the peroration just yet. It's question number five from Keir Starmer. Speaker, there we have it. They're the party of excess oil and gas profits. We're the party of working people. Yeah. Mr Speaker, talking, talking of parties, talking of parties, Prime Minister. Oh, very good. Mm. He Amazing told pivot. the House no rules were broken in Downing Street during lockdown. The police have now concluded there was widespread criminality. The Ministerial Code says that ministers who knowingly mislead the House should resign. Why is he still here? Hang on, hang on, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. Is this, uh, he's just changed his position. Sorry, Mr. I mean... We do, we do at least expect some consistency from uh, this, this human weather vane. 
it, was only, it was only a week or so ago where he was saying that I, I shouldn't resign. He's, He's got to make. What is it? What is his position, Mr. Speaker? Uh, we, of course, the, of course, the the the, the, Met must, uh, the investigators must must get on with their job. But in the meantime, uh, 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 let the, let, and we and they should. Let, in the meantime, in the meantime, Mr. Speaker, we are going to get on uh, with our job. And uh, what we are what we are focusing on is tackling the cost of living, uh, helping people, helping people uh, through the spike in fuel prices, the 9.1 billion uh, that the Chancellor has set out, but also, Mr Speaker, doing the long... I've mentioned nuclear power, I've mentioned tackling our, our energy supplies, which Labour totally failed to do. What we're also doing, far more important perhaps even than that, Mr Speaker, we're tackling illiteracy and innumeracy in our schools. Uh, and I think uh, we're investing billions in tutoring, uh, Mr Speaker. That's what we're focusing on, and I think that's what the people of this country want us to focus on. When I said Boris Johnson was newly focused on the detail, <laughs> what I mean was he was about to just do a massive brain fart all over the dispatch box. And you can tell because he referred to the Met in a very sort of casual, you know, it was one stop short of oh, the, the calling Met. them but the But what cops. about all this other stuff? Nuclear power, illiteracy, numeracy, tutoring, whoa! So the thing that he was talking about, about uh, Keir Starmer being unclear if he was calling for a design of course. Of course, uh, Keir Starmer called for him to resign over party guy earlier in the year. Then in the beginning of this month, uh, Keir Starmer went on the, the the Sunday, what's it called, with Sophie Rayworth, the thing that used to be, Sunday morning it's called, used to be um, uh, used to be Andrew Marr. Uh, and he said um, that, he, that there needed to be unity. He said, uh, whatever challenge the frustrations of criticism I have the Prime Minister, I've got many on this issue, there is unity, obviously he talked about Ukraine, and it's very important we demonstrate unity. Um, Up until the point that the Met stopped. Finding people. Yes, and pressed on whether or not uh, he was calling for the Prime Minister to resign. He said, well, look, at the moment, the Prime Minister obviously concentrating on the job in hand and we stand united as the UK on that issue. Although later, a number 10 spokesman said they did still think that Boris Johnson should resign. So in a whole day, they couldn't make... But I'm intrigued by Boris Johnson's outrage that it's not clear whether or not Keir Starmer wants him to resign, as if that would it, make any difference to his a decision. It's slightly uh, a dubious point, isn't it? But... Um, <laughs> In, buried in that sort of splurge of words <laughs> was a phrase which I think we'll hear more of, which was, is, I think, rather better than Captain Hindsight, the human weather vane. And that does come up in the focus groups. You do hear people, you know, traditionally leaders of the opposition are criticised for being opportunists. Classic of Boris Johnson to find a slightly more interesting way of saying that. Um, and I think we'll be hearing that phrase. You'll need to start pinging your bell when we hear human weather human vane. Weather vane. I, you could also just see his face being uh, photoshopped on a weather vane, blowing in the wind. It's on all... the front page of the sun, in all likelihood. Oh, there we are. Uh, right, uh, here we go. It's the thing we've been waiting for, Tim. It's Keir Starmer's Stand peroration. By. Stand by, everyone. Hold on to your spines, everybody. They're going to tingle. Uh, here we go. This is question number six. The last question of PMQs in this parliamentary term before the Easter holidays. Let's go live to the House of Commons. Keir Starmer... Look, there are only two possible explanations. Either he's trashing the ministerial code, yeah. Yeah. or he's claiming he was repeatedly lied to by his own advisers yeah. and that he didn't know what was going on in his own house and his own office. Yeah. Come off it. Yeah. He really does think that it's one rule for him yeah. and another rule for everyone else. Yeah. That he can pass off criminality in his office yeah. and ask others to follow the law. Yeah. That he can keep raising taxes and call himself a tax cutter. Yes. That he can hike tax during a cost of living crisis and get credit for giving a bit back just before an election. Yes. When is he going to stop taking the British public for fools? Yes. Uh, Mr Speaker, this is, the, this is the leader of the opposition who would have kept this country in lockdown uh, and made it absolutely impossible. That, you know, he has zero consistency on, on any issue, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, but one thing we know about is he would like to take us back into the EU and take us back into lockdown, uh, if he possibly could. Uh, th thanks, thanks to what this government has done, uh, we have unemployment back down to the levels it was before the pandemic, the economy bigger than it was, uh, we have record vacancies, Mr Speaker. The difference between them and us is, is they want to keep people... Mr. Speaker, they want to keep people on benefits. We want to help people into work. And that's what we're doing uh, in record numbers. Uh, they want to raise taxes. We want to cut taxes. And that's what we're doing, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, 
Well, we're tackling, we're tackling illiteracy. They didn't give a damn, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we're getting on with making this country, making this country the best place to invest. Last time I updated the House, Mr. Speaker, on the number of unicorns that we had in, of unicorns in this country. That's tech countries worth more than a billion dollars, Mr. Speaker. I said we had a hundred. I can inform you now, Mr. Speaker, that we now have 120. They don't want to hear it, but let me tell you, that's, that's more than France, that's more than Germany, that's more than Israel, it's more than France, Germany, Israel combined, Mr. Speaker. That's what's happening under this government. That's what's happening because of the tough decisions we've taken. We take the tough decisions, we deliver, they play politics, Mr. Speaker. Uh, reminder, the, the question was actually about uh, parties in number 10 and uh, tax bills. But the, the, the thump of the seal pour on the dispatch box, <laughs> he does not mind. Uh, Boris Johnson accusing Keir Starmer of zero consistency on any issue. Yeah, and then using a line which, again, I mean, it's it's stretching things to the limit, but within the sort of ballpark of what we're likely to hear in the run-up to the next election, they want to take us back into the EU and back into lockdown, which is, I think... Obviously nonsense on both counts, but kind of, <laughs> but kind of within the sort of wheelhouse of what Keir Starmer thinks about the world. Um, you know, they want to raise taxes. We want to cut them. We haven't got round to it yet, but we we'd really like to. We will, to. just before the exit And then unicorns, which anyone who remembers the Brexit debate was beginning to come out in a cold sweat at that point, but he was in fact talking about... Uh, companies worth a billion pounds. I mean, not, that not, what... not countries, as he said there. The the stream of consciousness that we got. I must mention the unicorns. Yes, I mean, and but, you know that was a. I mean, I think it's pretty clear he won the peroration battle, um, and that's quite important for Boris Johnson. I mean, he had every Tory MP to dinner, and um, one can only imagine uh, what sort of social occasion that must have been like. Um, but you know, the next few weeks are going to decide whether those MPs put in letters calling for votes of confidence in him and all the rest of it. Very important to send them away to their constituencies at Easter uh, with a song in their hearts. And there was a lot of noise behind him there. I think uh, he'll be pretty happy with how that went. I think you could well be right. Well, that brings us to the end of PMQ's Unpacked. You can carry on watching along on uh, the YouTube channel. We'll do the best of the rest next. Tim Shipman, Chief Political Commentator of the Sunday Times, will still be here. We'll look at the rest of the... Uh, well, the best of the rest of the questions. Basically, we cut out all the boring ones. You don't have to sit through them. We'll do that next after we get the very latest news from Cara Bentley. Across the UK, on DAB, online and on your smart speaker... This is Times Radio. Good afternoon. Sir Keir Starmer has challenged the Prime Minister on his previous comments about parties during the Covid lockdowns in government buildings after the Metropolitan Police announced that it was issuing 20 fines following an investigation. He told the House no rules were broken in Downing Street during lockdown. The police have now concluded there was widespread criminality. The Ministerial Code says that ministers who knowingly mislead the House should resign. Yeah. Why is he still here? The Prime Minister has not received a fixed penalty notice, according to his spokesperson, but more could be given out when more material is investigated. In response, Boris Johnson said the police should be left to get on with their job of investigating and let the government be too. In the meantime, Mr Speaker, we are going to get on uh, with our job. And uh, what, we are, what we are focusing on is tackling the cost of living, uh, helping people, helping people uh, through the spike in fuel prices, the 9.1 billion uh, that the Chancellor has set out. A report into failings of maternity services at Shrewsbury and Telford NHS Trust has found that 201 babies and nine mothers could have survived if their care had been better. The independent report looked into more than 1,500 clinical incidents, mostly between 2000 and 2019. Report author Donna Ockenden says there were not enough staff, a lack of ongoing training, a lack of effective investigation and governance at the Trust and a culture of not listening to the families involved. Involved. The mother of Baby P, the child who died after months of abuse, is to be released from prison. A parole board has decided Tracy Connolly should be freed 13 years after she was jailed. 25,500 refugees from Ukraine have been given visas to come to the UK. It's just over 40% of the number who've applied. The UN Refugee Agency says more than 4 million people have now fled Ukraine since the invasion began. 
The Conservative MP Jamie Wallace, who has announced that he is transgender, has confirmed that he still wants to be referred to as he and him. Mr Wallace posted a statement on Twitter saying he had wished to keep his gender dysphoria private until he had left Parliament. The MP for Bridge End and Porth Cowl has now said, I am proud to be completely open and honest about the struggles I have had and continue to have with my identity. However, I remain the same person I was yesterday. Rain and hill snow continuing south across England and Wales. Rather cloudy with some scattered showers ahead, but bright and cold to the north with heavy sleet, hail and snow showers. Toby Gillis has the sport. Shane Warne's father has told of the unimaginable pain his family felt when they discovered news of the cricket legend's death. Friday the 4th of March 2022. Darkest day in our family's life. It was a day that our son, Shane Keith Warne, was tra tragically and suddenly taken from us. 50,000 people have gathered at the Melbourne Cricket Ground for a state memorial to say their final goodbyes to the legendary cricketer. But in typical Shane Warne style, there was humour too. Dad Keith regaling how Shane honed his famous ability to outwit an opponent from an early age using his brother. For instance, he would tell Jason how quick he was. And as he was so much quicker than Shane, why doesn't he run up the local shop and get him a chocolate bar and coat. You're just so fast, Shane would say. Of course, young Jace fell for it every time and off to the shop he would go. For more coverage of the War Memorial, listen to Talk Sport throughout the day. Well, just hours before it, Australia's cricketing women did Shane Warne proud strolling into the World Cup final. They beat West Indies by 157 runs. They could play England in the final if they beat South Africa in their semi. England football fans are being told to trust manager Gareth Southgate after a vocal minority booed defender Harry Maguire's selection against Ivory Coast last night. The manager was furious at them, insisting they'll need him playing well if they're to have success at the World Cup this year. Former England striker Gabby Agbonlahor told us Southgate deserves our trust. Yes, he's not in his best form, but if Gareth Southgate wanted to play a player that hasn't played all season, that's his choice. He played Calvin Phillips, who was in the Championship. And it worked. So he's got that power as England manager to make whatever call he wants. And the Egyptian FA says Liverpool's Mo Salah was racially abused as his nation lost out to Senegal in their World Cup playoff. The forward was also targeted by lasers as he stepped up to take his penalty in the shootout, which he blazed over the bar. Egypt's players were also reportedly pelted by bottles and rocks during the warm-up. Remember, coverage of the World Cup finals draw is on Friday on TalkSport. This is Times Radio. 30 million people around the world are just like me. I value being able to easily build an investment portfolio. I value knowing my investment firm has been recommended by which? Three years in a row. And I value knowing I'm with a company that's picked clients first for over 45 years. Join the 30 million investors around the world who value getting Vanguard value. Hey, that's exactly what I was going to say. Vanguard. Value to investors. When investing, your capital is at risk. Matt Chorley. Mid-morning on Times Radio. A very good afternoon to you. If you were watching along on YouTube, you'd have seen me dancing to the adverts. So that's something. Uh, <laughs> you can't unsee. Uh, Tim Shipman, Chief Political Commentator of the Sunday Times, is still here. Before we listen to the best of the rest, uh, Tim, somebody's po somebody's just uh, tweeted saying, is there an argument that Starmer, this is John saying, is there an argument that Starmer should not ask his sixth question and leave Johnson without the opportunity to do his final pre-written speech that had nothing to do with the question asked? Well, there's that an would annoy him. Yeah, I mean, the other thing that Starmer can do, and previous leaders of the opposition have done this, there's nothing to say you have to take all six questions in one go. And particularly when Starmer wants to pivot between two issues and doesn't have a great sort of uh, linking theme between them, um, it, you can often throw the PM off his game by doing three and then sitting down and then coming back after the 15-minute mark and having another crack at it. David Cameron did that quite a lot, didn't he, when he first became leader? That's he did right. something quite... At the time, it's seen as quite worthy and right on, you yes, know, grown up, African, bit of positioning, Africa, climate yeah. change, whatever, and then come back with three knockabout questions, taking the mick out of Tony Blair. And it, it seemed to work quite well as establishing yourself. But also, it just means you don't have to do that terrible gear change in the middle. Anyway, that's enough of uh, Keir Starmer. Uh, this is what everyone's been waiting for. Let's take a listen to Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And it's good to see the member for Bridgend uh, in the chamber this afternoon. I commend him for his statement earlier today. That's Jamie Wallace he's referring Mr. to. Mr Speaker, last night, millions of families will have been desperately trying to figure out how they will possibly afford the £700 energy price hike that will hit them this yep. Friday. Yep. 
Mr Speaker, at the very same time, Tory MPs were gathering across the street for a champagne bash in the Park Plaza. We all know, we all know that the Tories parted during lockdown and now Mr. Fabricant, Easter is upon us. I don't need you to ruin your Easter. So let's hear, uh, uh, all of you, SNP leader Ian Blackford, uh. we can shout and scream when we're raising the Tory cost of living crisis, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah. Because we all know that the Tories parted during lockdown, and now they're parting through the cost of living emergency. Yeah. Exactly. Last week, the Chancellor got it badly badly wrong with the spring statement. And ever since, the Prime Minister has been busy briefing against him, saying that more needs to be done. For once, I agree with the Prime Minister. So if the Prime Minister really believes that more needs to be done, can he tell us exactly what he will order his Chancellor to do to help the millions of families who are facing a £700 price hike this Friday? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I, th I thank him uh, very much. And, uh, uh, he is, uh, and he's, I think he's in, in error in what he says about events last night, but he is, like me, a living testament to the benefits of uh, moderation uh, in all things, uh, <laughs> Mr Speaker. I believe that's what you call a fat uh, joke. I can, <laughs> I can assure him... I can assure him that we are... Ian Blackford we are doesn't look in, very impressed. This week, for instance, uh, to get to his point, uh, what's happening actually is that the living wage is going up again uh, by record amounts. And thanks to what the Chancellor has done, uh, we are putting £9.1 billion uh, into helping people up and down the country. Uh, and what I might respectfully suggest is actually, uh, I think the, the Scottish Nationalist Government, the, with whom, as I say, we work increasingly well, I think the thing they could focus on uh, for long-term prosperity of Scotland is the educational system. System, where I'm sad to see, where I, I'm sad to see, I'm sad to see Scotland's once glorious record uh, falling behind. <laughs> well, now, much as we occasionally poke fun at Ian Blackford, as a political, a sharp political attack, you parted during lockdown, and now you're parting during the cost of living crisis. Is sharper than basically Keir Starmer joined, managed in six questions. Joined it all together in in one line that Starmer didn't think of. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then gets hit with a fact joke in return. To be fair to Boris Johnson, he's reasonably happy to poke fun at his own... Um, I mean, it was a self-deprecating... Yes. Yeah. I mean, I remember going out on the election trail with him during the referendum, and there was me, him, and uh, his former aide, who was a... You know, I was pushing 16 stone, and I was the lightest of the three, let's put it that way. <laughs> and we had a pub lunch, and the uh, the waitress came out with a... Uh, with, the, with trying to persuade us to have a pudding, and Boris just sort of said... I, 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 you know, I think collectively we are putting it out. <laughs> <laughs> Which was a very fair comment. And uh, uh, Lindsay Hoyle getting his all in uh, uh, on the last day of term. Michael Fabricant was the Tory MP, obviously heckling. An Lindsay Hoyle. Easy target, Mr. Fabricant. Um, um, Lindsay Hoyle wearing both a yellow and uh, blue ribbon and a bright yellow and blue uh, Ukrainian style tie as well to show his. Uh, allegiance. Right, uh, so that was Ian Blackford. Um, as it's the last uh, last PMQs of this term, before they have it off for the Easter holidays, the Lib Dem leader, Sir Ed Davey, got to go as well. Let's take a listen. During the Second World War, my grandmother, like countless other people across our country, opened her home to evacuees, including two German Jewish boys. Over 70 years later, the British people want to shelter desperate refugees again. Two weeks ago, I was speaking to refugee families on the Ukrainian-Polish border at Medica. Some desperately wanted to come to our country. One elderly couple told me, however, they'd been told that it was just too complicated. Now the government's own figures say the same. Paperwork is being put ahead of people. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, when wealthy businessmen from over 50 countries can come to the UK visa-free... Yeah. Why does the Prime Minister insist that a traumatised Ukrainian mother and child yeah. must first fill out a visa form? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Minister. Uh, Mrs Big, I think we have... We, um, thank you very much. And, um, he, he, uh, and uh, he's right about the generosity of his country and, uh, and, and he's right to draw attention to his own family's uh, generosity in, in this matter. Everybody, I think, is, is pulling together the number of people who have come forward 
to offer their homes is, is, is incredible. Um, but I really don't think that he should, uh, he should deprecate what the, uh, the UK is offering. We've already given 25,000 25, people have already got visas, uh, Mr Speaker. We are processing 1,000 a day. 1,000 a day, and there is no limit, there is no upper limit to the number that we can take. And this is a country that has already been the most generous in taking uh, people from Afghanistan, the 15,000 under Operation Pitting, 104,000 applications from, uh, from the Hong Kong Chinese. Uh, this is a country that is overwhelmingly generous to people coming in fear of their lives from. Yes, it is, Mr. Speaker, and so, and so is this government. Not bad line there from uh, Ed Davey. Paperwork has been put before people. Um, although this argument uh, that people should be able to come here, I mean, there's, a, there's I suppose there's a, there's a difference in there. You could have people coming here uh, on a more straightforward system, which isn't the same as saying you don't need a visa at all. Uh, yeah, and it's good Heartland's issue for the Lib Dems. Um, he did it quite well. Um, Johnson has a, an argument in return, which is... You know, um, and some of those other schemes, we've been reasonably generous. I think no one would say this one has operated um, particularly smoothly. Um, uh, but equally, you know, we all think this is a great thing, but there are parts of the country that don't think having lots of people arriving from abroad is a great thing. So, you know, it's it's always a difficult political issue. Uh, uh, let's just round things off uh, the best of the West from PMQs. Uh, the Conservative MP uh, for Telford, Lucy Allen, uh, raise this this story which has been dominating the news uh, today about this terrible report into maternity care at her local uh, Shropshire and Telford NHS Trust. Let's take a listen. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Prime Minister for his earlier remarks concerning the Donna Ockenden report into avoidable maternity deaths and injuries at the Shrewsbury and Telford Hospital Trust. The report makes for devastating reading, yeah. the more so because women's voices were ignored. Absolutely. My constituent Hayley Matthews begged staff for a C-section throughout her 36-hour labour but was forced into a natural birth. Her son Jack arrived blue and floppy and within hours of his birth he tragically died. Will the Prime Minister join me in offering heartfelt sympathies to all the families affected and also grateful thanks to the 1,862 women uh, who shared their experiences with the Ockenden Review to ensure that maternity care is safer, kinder and more compassionate for the women that come after them. Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, I, I thank my honourable friend for her question. I think everybody uh, will thank the the women concerned for uh, taking up the issue in the way that, uh, uh, that they have and, and will extend our, our heartfelt uh, sympathies to uh, the, the victims and their, and their families and for, for what they've suffered. Uh, it is very important that uh, people get the answers that they deserve, Mr Speaker, but also uh, that we have the, the right approach uh, to, uh, to this issue in, in the future. And, and that's why we're investing very substantially in uh, maternity services and also, of course, uh, very substantially in, uh, in midwives and in our NHS altogether. Sorry, Chair. Uh, there, so that rounds off uh, PMQs. And we're going to hear a, um, there's a statement uh, due to uh, start uh, shortly. Sajid Javid, the Health Secretary, is updating the House of Commons, given the sort of formal government response to this. But this report is terrible, isn't it, Tony? Yeah, and, you know, as someone like Boris Johnson, who isn't that many months removed from having been in, um, uh, you know, a delivery suite myself, um, this stuff is pretty visceral. Um, and you... You know, you often know that it can be touch and go when you're in there. It's, um, you know, people do the best they can. But uh, sometimes people have their own views in these hospitals about how things should happen. And they're not always that responsive to uh, the woman's wishes. Um, and I hope this is a wake up call. Um, for the whole industry, frankly. But, absolutely. It, and it, you know, uh, uh, when also, we uh, were there, there's a shortage of midwives. It's very difficult. Yeah. The personnel, all the people working there are working very hard. They're completely overstretched for the most part. Um, and, you know, uh, I think most people would think you couldn't put too much money into maternity care, frankly. Yeah, absolutely. But that's probably true of large parts of the NHS. Um, and there'll be more uh, coverage of that report that, that, uh, on uh, Shrewsbury Telford Hospital. Uh, we'll, uh, throughout the day here on Times Radio. Kate Borsa is going to be here from one o'clock and, of course, John Pinner with Times Radio Drive from four o'clock. That brings us to the end of our coverage of PMQs for this term. Um, you're off on your holidays as well, Tim? 
uh, in a little while. <laughs> very good. Very good. Me too. Uh, Tim Shipp, you can, of course, read Tim uh, in the Sunday Times every week, apart from when he's on, on his holidays. Uh, uh, lovely and stuff. Sometimes and even sometimes then. even when he is on holiday. <laughs> uh, very good. Uh, right, uh, coming up, uh, Jackie Weaver is going to be here to respond to the report that she didn't have the authority yet either. Anyway, as it turned out, we'll do that next. Wake up to Britain's brightest early breakfast with Callum MacDonald on Times Radio with Nutmeg, the digital wealth manager. Thought-provoking analysis, insight and debate as the day's biggest stories break. Plus, get all the latest economic and financial news experts